My name is Brian Sorensen, and I am the state traffic engineer with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and one of Minnesota's three TZD program co-chairs. This, this afternoon's session is the fifth of 12 webinars highlighting the latest trends and traffic safety initiatives with expert guests sharing a cross-section of tra traffic safety topics. You can find the list of all topics and speakers on the TZD website, minnesotatzd.org. There's a ton of great information being shared. And once again this year, it is all free. First, we wanna take a moment to thank all the individuals who helped put on the webinar series. A huge thank you to all the session organizers, e-leaders, speakers, moderators, and the countless difference makers behind the scenes that allow us to put these sessions together and to bring them to you. I wanna express a special thank you to our friends at Do Good Events, and the University of Minnesota's Center for Transportation Studies, who have once again this year led the development of the webinar series and had to do so in fairly short order. Thank you for your partnership and for your dedication to Minnesota TZD. I'd also like to recognize that this webinar series is offered by the Minnesota Towards Zero Deaths Program and the Minnesota Departments of Health, Public Safety, and Transportation with funding from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. A giant thank you to our loyal and generous sponsors for this year's webinar series, Bolton and Mink, AAA Minnesota, Iowa, the Auto Club Group, HDR, Highway Credit Union, and the Minnesota Prevention Alliance. Thank you for supporting traffic safety and the TZD program in Minnesota. Before we start the official webinar topic, the TZD program is excited to recognize the recipient of the 2021 TZD Emerging Leader Award, Avery Malone. This award is given to Avery in recognition of her exemplary leadership in increasing student traffic safety awareness. For the past three years, Avery has been a member of the Lincoln High School Key Club in Thief River Falls. Partway through the school year last year, Avery and her family moved to Perm. She chose to finish out the year at Thief River Falls and to continue to be involved with the Key Club all via Zoom. While working remotely, Avery continued to push the work of Teen TZD and TZD. She helped plan and organize celebrity visits on the final day of school, which by the way included State Patrol, City Chief of Police, Head of Emergency, Ser Emergency Medical Services, the Seatbelt Savior, and the Grim Reaper. How do you get contact information for the Grim? I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Avery also helped to lead and coordinate the work on the TZ, Teen TZD website. So at a time when many students were shutting down and pulling away from working remotely, Avery stepped up and pulled students together to continue the critical work of reducing life-changing crashes on our roadways. Avery, congratulations on your well-earned award. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you so much. I am so honored that I was nominated and won the award. Um, when I first received the email that I had won the award, I sat in shock because I hadn't realized that I had played a big part um, in the TTZD and TZD um, to be recognized. Um, I want to thank Rosalind Groven for the nomination, as well as Stacey Leak. Um, those are my two advisors from Thief River Falls. They are amazing leaders and I look up to them and I thank them for having such a great impact on me. And then I want to thank my parents for encouraging me to join Key Club and supporting me through it. Um, and I want to thank everyone here today for attending and to everyone who has helped organize this event. Well, congratulations again, Avery, and thank you for all that you're doing to improve safety on our roadways through engaging both young and future drivers. As we at, T at TZD continue to work on addressing cultural behavior issues, I think you've given us a great example of how we can make a difference through awareness and education. And I'm excited we have emerging leaders like you to help show us the way in the coming years. Keep up the great work, Avery. Now, on to our topic for today. One of the most challenging cultural behavior issues we know we're gonna need Avery's help on is speed. While we've been wrestling with COVID, the COVID pandemic over the past year and a half, another lesser known pandemic emerged across the country and one that Minnesota is not immune to. 
Fatalities on our roadways climbed as drivers became more willing to drive at ever increasing and exceedingly unsafe speeds. In Minnesota, traffic fatalities in 21 have increased by 34% compared to 2019. We are currently at 100, we're actually over 100 more fatalities than we had uh, at the end of October in 2019. And speed has played a significant role in this increase. You can see here how the number of speed related fatalities has jumped in the past two years compared to other factors. To put this in terms of overall fatalities, speed as a factor in fatal crashes has grown from 13% of fatal crashes in 2019 to 19% in 2020 to 26% so far in 2021. Speed is therefore twice as likely to be a factor in a fatal crash in 2021 in Minnesota than it was in 2019. And it's not just that drivers are going over the speed limit, they're often traveling at ridiculous speeds. Through the middle of September this year, the Minnesota State Patrol issued tickets for 100 miles per hour or more, increased by 128% from 2019. This is a staggering increase that reflects a growing willingness, willingness to engage in risky driving behavior. So what can we do? First, let me note that I think we could have filled our whole Minnesota TZD webinar series this year with the issue of speed. Speeding on our roadway system is a complex cultural issue that we'll be wrestling with for years to come, together with our cohorts across the country and the world. I also want to note that we know enforcement needs to be part of the solution. We're not going to be exploring the role of enforcement in our webinar today, but I should mention that in our final session on November 17, State and Highway Patrol Chiefs from California, Colorado, and Minnesota will be discussing what's happening on our roadways from an enforcement perspective. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the topic of speed just might come up. I am excited about what we do have for you today. Dr. Nicole Morris from the University of Minnesota's Human First Lab will be presenting some work they've done around public perception of speed. Mark Vizisky from MnDOT's Office of State Aid will cover what we've done in Minnesota in developing a vision for setting speed limits. And Jessica Schleck will share with you the work of a committee we've assembled specifically to tackle the growing issue of speed in our state. To help us navigate today's session, Stephanie Malinoff, the Senior Director of Engagement and Technical Assistance at the University of Minnesota Center for state Transportation Studies will be our moderator. For those that are familiar with Minnesota's TZD program, you know Steph, is one of the people that makes the program go. And she's a very skilled facilitator of sessions like the one we have for you this afternoon. Thank you for moderating today, Steph, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you for the kind words, Brian. And thanks for all the information that you just shared in setting up today's session and this pandemic that we're facing on our roads today. Let me dig into a few housekeeping items before we start our presentations. If you have questions, we ask that you enter them in the Q&A box on your screen. I am going to save questions for after all three presenters are done, just to make sure we have uh, time to get through everybody and we are anticipating a good discussion after all three presentations today. If you need technical help, please use the chat box. We have several people behind the scenes monitoring that and we'll reach out to help. And just a reminder, all attendees are muted and have their video turned off for today's presentations. We do offer continuing education credit for today's webinars as shown on your screen. We ask that you visit the Minnesota TZD website to access the credit forms that you'll need for your records. For our law enforcement viewers who are receiving post board credit for today's webinar, please read this important announcement from the post board. Whether you're watching this webinar live or recorded, please watch the webinar in its entirety and follow instructions on the TZD website. The link to that page will be found in the chat box if you need easy access to it. And now on to what you all came for, our presentations. We have three great speakers with us today, all familiar faces to the Minnesota TZD program. Nicole Morris is gonna start us off. She's the director of the Human First Lab in the Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Minnesota. And as Brian said in his comments, she'll be presenting results on some work they've done recently around public perceptions of speed. 
Mark V, as we affectionately refer to him, will, is the operations engineer at MnDOT's Office of State Aid. And he's going to talk about some work that we've been doing in Minnesota in developing a vision for setting speed limits. And Jessica Schleck will be our third presenter today. Jessica is our Southeast Minnesota TCD Regional Coordinator, and she's gonna talk about the work of a committee that we've been putting together to tackle this growing issue of speed here in Minnesota. So with that, let me turn it over to, to Dr. Morris. Nicole, if you wanna flip on your video and start turning your, share your screen to share your slides. While she's doing that, let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Morris. She is the director of the Human First Lab in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Morris is a research scholar at the Center for Transportation Studies at the university. She's a graduate faculty member of the Human Factors and Ergonomics program at the U of M as well. Her research interests include human factors, safety, gender disparities, judgment and decision-making, and human systems interactions. Nicole, it is all yours. All right, well, thank you everyone. This is a great crowd, so I'm really excited to, to share these results with you um, from my lab's work at the Minnesota State Fair this year. So first I wanna share a little bit about the facility. If you're not familiar with the D2D, D2D building, this is a property of the University of Minnesota on the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. And it's a really great opportunity for us to engage with a really broad audience of um, Minnesota drivers and road users to, to get their, their feedback and perceptions of, of really complex issues that it would be really hard for us to capture um, on campus. And so um, we were there this year, the fair was a little bit different, um, but we still got really great engagement from folks. And that always um, helps a little bit if it rains because it pushes people inside the building to get out of the rain. And so um, we did get to take advantage of that. So we were there two days this year, um, and, and these are in about five hour sessions, but we're asking people to come in and give us a little bit of their time for, um, to, to participate in research. So um, this is a lot of information here, but just to give you an idea of the sample of individuals that we had um, come through the survey. So we had 336 individuals agreed to participate in the, the survey. We had a slight undersampling of men this year. Um, and our, our age group was a little bit broader because we did have um, some teen drivers who had learner's permits, they were permitted to participate in the research. And so the, the mean age was a little low for the average licensed driver in Minnesota, which is, which is about 47 years old. Um, but we still had a really nice um, diverse um, age group participating. And then looking at the other um, breakdown of our population. So we had, um, some sampling errors here where we had an undersampling of black or African-American individuals. Um, and we also had some education bias with this sample just by the, the sheer nature of this being a University of Minnesota building. It tends to attract a lot of, um, you know, retired University of Minnesota faculty or alum who wanna see what's going on at the U or just in general people who are interested in participating in research. Um, so we did have an undersampling of individuals who, with a high school diploma and an oversampling of individuals who have a advanced degree, a graduate or professional degree. The location of our, our participants really varied as well. Um, we, we didn't uh, limit people from participating if they didn't live in Minnesota. We assumed that those drivers um, if they're here in Minnesota are likely driving on Minnesota roadways. And so um, they still offer a valuable perspective of um, how they perceive um, you know, speeding behavior on our roadways. And many of the participants from out of state were from Wisconsin. It's, um, we assume that they're, they're sort of crossing the border frequently. And, and as you go on down that list, they were um, less and less frequent. Um, there was someone who reported being from 90210 zip code. Um, I'm going to assume that one was uh, fake. So, the, so there isn't California, but who knows? There could have actually been someone from 90210 who participated in the survey. Um, 
when I look at the zip codes, I, I code them for a population and whether or not they um, were in the seven county metro. And, and this does fairly closely resemble census information for Minnesotans who live in a large city or urban area. So this is a fairly close representation of kind of how our, our population is distributed across the state from um, large cities and the seven county metro area. Um, a majority of the drivers were, were driving either a SUV or a passenger vehicle. Um, we had some variability of those. We had one ambulance driver, which I thought was really fun. Um, and then we asked them about in the last, at last three years, um, whether or not they were in an at-fault crash. So not a whole lot of individuals were involved in, in a crash that they um, reported to be at fault. And um, we had a, about 10% had received a speeding ticket in the, um, the last three years, uh, just a few that had received D a DWI or a, um, a citation for distracted or dangerous driving. So, you know, one of the things I was really curious about is just what is the temperature of, of our fleet of drivers in terms of how big of a problem do they think speeding is when it relates to transportation safety? Um, and so, you know, we had a bit of a distribution here, but about half of the participants thought that it, it was a moderate problem. Um, and then we sort of ranged out from um, only, only just of over 20% thought it was a serious problem. And we had um, about 10 or so individuals who thought it wasn't a problem at all. So we asked them to report how likely they were to travel over the speed limit in, in different ranges of speed limit zones. So we were asking them, typically, how fast do you travel when you're on a city street that's 20 miles an hour, that's 30 miles an hour, if you're on a, a highway um, or county road that's 55, 60, or an interstate that is 70 miles an hour. And so um, people gave this information to us whether or not they tended to tra travel right at the speed limit, um, one to five over and on up um, of those that were reporting that they were traveling um, over 20 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fewer and far between, although it's interesting how we see a, a similar um, distribution of those that report to be traveling over 25, 20 miles an hour, regardless of the speed limit zone. Um, where you know traveling 90 miles an hour is obviously quite dangerous, but it really is a very different scenario when you're traveling in a residential or, or a city area where it's marked at 20 miles an hour to be going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, but certainly, we're seeing those types of behaviors every day in the cities uh, where people are traveling, you know, 50 miles an hour in a 20 or 25 mile an hour zone. So we asked individuals to share with us why they um, tend to speed, you know, various reasons, and they were allowed to select as many options as they liked. And um, we allowed them to, to give um, an, another, if, if they had some other thing that they wanted to, to um, include that we hadn't provided. So um, the, the greatest number of individuals who said they sped was because they thought the speed limits are too low. Um, followed by those who thought they just simply won't be pulled over. Um, and, and then we have people who, who say, you know, I'm in a rush. I don't know what the speed limit is. I lost track of, um, you know, how fast I was going and I didn't mean to go so fast. Um, interestingly, we didn't include, and in hindsight, we should have, but I didn't include as a standard option, uh, keeping up with traffic or going with the flow of traffic. And we had a number of people who um, then indicated other and they typed in that they um, will speed to, to go with the flow of traffic. And, and I sort of broke this up into two different categories because there were a number of these responses where people reported that they keep up with traffic sort of as a matter of fact, like, you know, I'm, that's just what you do. You just keep up with traffic. Other people are going fast and, and so I will go fast too. But there was sort of another subsect of of this group who reported that they keep up with the speed of traffic, but not really because they want to, but because they feel very pressured to do so. Like they feel that it's unsafe if they don't keep up with traffic. Um, 
you know, they weren't using exactly the term speed differentials, but sort of implying that it may be unsafe for them to travel the speed limit or being nervous about being tailgated and, and having people riding their tail. Um, there were some other individuals who sort of shared that they just thought it was easier if they can get past all the other drivers, then they don't have to worry about other drivers. Um, and, and perhaps my favorite one was someone re reported that they go fast because they want to get away from all the other unsafe drivers, um, which I think is a bit of some cognitive dissonance there of um, not realizing that that individual is an unsafe driver because they are speeding. So this really speaks to a, a disconnect and really the varied reasons why um, people speed. Some of these are sort of um, individual preferences and some are very situational um, uh, instances where they, they feel they, they must or they get pressured into doing it for time pressure. So one thing I was really curious about as I was looking to splice up this data is of people who think speeding is a problem, how likely are they to speed themselves? And so here I have uh, two graphs, one of um, people's reported speeding behavior in a 20 mile an hour zone in a 30 mile an hour zone, and how then we have a breakdown of whether or not they think speeding is a problem. And so you can see we have in the 20 mile an hour zone, there's a number of individuals who will report they're, they're commonly going one to five miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, and then once we get a, a bit higher, we start to see a split where those who don't think speeding um, is a problem are more likely to be going in those higher zones. And you see that also in the 30 mile an hour um, roadways where those who don't think speeding is a problem or are more likely to be traveling at those higher speeds. So going up to our higher um, speed limits, we see a very similar pattern, although we tend to see a bit of a breakaway in that 20 mile an hour plus zone. So when you get into the, the 60 mile an hour roadways and the 70 mile an hour roadways, that's where you tend to see those individuals who are what we would call super speeders or super speeding going very, very fast um, are those that don't think that speeding is a problem, indicating that they um, don't feel unsafe or they don't think that the, the act itself is unsafe. It's not an issue for safety to be going quite that fast. So in trying to come up with a nice way to quantify um, all of this range of speeding behaviors, what I did was I took the self-reported self speeding and I converted it into a propensity score. So with each speed bin, as they went over the speed limit, I assigned a value from one to six. And then we had a, a range of um, different roadways that we asked them about, different situational events where they may um, report to be speeding. So, you know, if, if they are, they're in a rush and they're on a neighborhood street or in a rush on a highway, and we asked sort of a number of different scenarios. And so I took the sum of those scores across all categories and assigned then each individual um, with a, a speed propensity score. And so this sort of shows the distribution where we have a clustering um, between sort of 10 and 20 is where most folks um, reported that they are, are speeding on different range of road types. Um, and then we have a little bit of a, a skew distribution here of those that, that were getting a really high score of up to 42. So those are individuals that were reporting super speeding 20 miles an hour and over and, and pretty much a, a wide range of all roadway types. So I was looking at how can we um, potentially predict speed propensity. And so um, I ran the, the data through a number of different regressions to see kind of what sort of shook out. And um, I, I took account of all the different reasons that individuals gave for um, speeding. And so, you know, some people said I'm, I'm in a rush and I also enjoy it. And, and I also think speed limits are too low. And, and so, you know, some individuals just had uh, a, a lot to offer in terms of why they had reasons to speed. And so when we took account of all of those um, together, then we saw that that was predictive, that the more reasons you have to speed, the more likely you are to be actually speeding on all these different roadways. 
Um, and we did see then there was a negative relationship between how much you think speeding is a problem and um, how likely you are to be reporting speeding on these range of roadways. So as the, the, the speed propensity score went down, then you saw they were more likely to say, yes, speeding is a, is a very big problem um, for safety. And finally, and probably quite unsurprisingly, um, age was negatively related with speed propensity. So as people get older, they tended to report less speeding propensity. And so it sort of gets to some of this um, youth, youthfulness and risk taking that we see very commonly in young drivers, that young drivers are more likely to be speeding on a wide range of roadways than older drivers. Um, however, while this is significant, I should note that this, um, this beta weight is not that large. So um, while it is an effect that the older you get, the less likely you are to be um, reporting speeding behavior, it's not as strong of a relationship as you would hope. So we still have a range of um, people at, at all ages that are still engaged in, in frequent speeding. And so this relationship is not as strong as I would hope. Um, some things that I, that I looked at that were not predictive. So gender was not predictive. There wasn't any relationship between uh, men and women reporting speeding behavior. Um, the, the crashes that were reported were not predictive, although you know, overall crash frequency tends to be low. But um, you know, I think we just didn't have enough data to see that relationship um, come through. And the same with tickets. So I didn't see a relationship with uh, tickets and speeding propensity. Um, and, and also some of their, um, which I'll get to in, here in a moment, um, their perceptions on enforcement, so how likely they think that they are to be pulled over or ticketed. I didn't see a real relationship between these, and and I think that those kind of cut um, a number of ways. So this is you know where traffic safety is very complicated because things are kind of working against one another. So while you would expect somebody who speeds a lot to um, be more likely to be ticketed a ticket in and of itself is supposed to be treatment. And so when you receive a ticket, the hope is that that actually makes you less likely to speed in the future. Um, although we do see from um, a number of research studies where they have done surveying of roadways and individuals who've been ticketed, it's not necessarily going to um, drive down individual behavior. So if you get a ticket, are you going to continue to speed following that? The answer is probably yes. Okay, so um, we were curious about, you know, what's the perception that people have that you would be pulled over for traveling um, certain sort of thresholds over the speed limit. Um, and so um, I didn't want to be too exhaustive here, but um, we, we asked this on neighborhood roads, but I'm going to focus on, on highways for this presentation. Um, so we were curious, you know, do you, do you think you'd be pulled over? And so as you can see for five over on the highway, uh, pretty universally, you know, people are, are in either somewhat disagreement or strong disagreement that you're going to be pulled over on the highway. So they think there's some chance, um, but few, few strongly agree that that's actually going to happen. And we tend to see a, a bit of a shift here where we, we shift from disagree to agree um, to some degree. Um, so people tend to think it's more likely that you will be pulled over for um, going 10 over on the highway. Um, and you can see there, there's a little bit of a shift here where um, people who think it's uh, speeding is a serious problem, they actually strongly disagree that you're gonna go over 10 on the highway. So, so this is kind of interesting because I was expecting a little bit the opposite. Like if you, um, if you think it's a serious problem, I, I thought perhaps they would think you would be um, ticketed and, and pulled over. But I think actually this sort of indicates a little bit of dissatisfaction with the likelihood that individuals will be pulled over. So um, if, you, if you think speeding is a serious problem, you may also feel like speed is out of control and we've lost control of how people, how fast people are going on the highway. And so this may be what we're seeing there of those folks that think speeding is a serious problem, but they also strongly disagree that you're going to be pulled over for going 10 over. Um, now, when you get to 20 over, 
now we start to have a, a big shift where the, the vast majority of people believe that, yes, absolutely, if you're going 20 over on the highway, um, you would be pulled over. Although now we start to see a, a little bit of a, um, a, again, a break here where those who think it's a serious problem um, of speeding on our highways still aren't, aren't very satisfied with the likelihood that you could be pulled over for going 20 over on the highway. So again, I think this is a, a bit of a disconnect here for people who are really worried about speeding, but feel like we're not doing enough to enforce our speed limits. Um, I also wanted to look at, you know, if you, if you report to speed on a 70 mile an hour highway, then what is your perceived chance of getting pulled over? So I was just curious, you know, if, if people think that law enforcement are very likely to pull them over, what's the likelihood that they themselves may be speeding on a 70 mile an hour highway? And here you do see a bit of a shift where um, those that are going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit um, on a 70 mile an hour highway they don't think that there is a, a very strong chance. You, you tend, to, tend to see a little bit of a shift here of those super speeders tend to have a pretty good sense that you know the, they'll probably get away with going 10 over um, on, the, on the highway, on its 70 mile an hour highway. So um, I thought that was interesting to sort of see this shift where um, some folks tend to, tend to think they've got more leeway than others to speed. So if you have heard me speak on speeding before, you probably heard me rail about speed limiters. So here I go again. Um, but you know, I think we, we have a lot of potential tools in our toolbox to reduce speeding on our roadways. And the one that we're not leveraging, and it doesn't appear that we have a lot of political will going forward to let leverage is speed limiters. Now the EU is starting to move forward on this. And I think the US is gonna lag really far behind. Um, but it's something that I'm really interested in. How much does the public um, accept the idea of speed limiters? How, how willing would they be to install it? So we did spend a little bit of time to describe this in the survey to make sure that, that folks knew what we were talking about. And then we asked them, how, how in favor would you be to voluntarily install a speed limiter on your vehicle? You can see we did not get um, very favorable results for people who said they would you know, somewhat or strongly be inclined to install. Uh, very few were in, in favor of that. Uh, most opposed, some were neutral. Um, we didn't, then saw a shift here where people were more accepting of this idea if manufacturers installed it in the vehicle. And I think that that probably speaks a bit to the fairness of the issue, right? Where I don't wanna install it on my vehicle because everybody around me is speeding and then I won't be able to keep up with the flow of traffic. But if this is something that is just being offered in all new vehicles, then maybe there's a little bit of fairness on the roadway. But if I go the speed limit, everyone else is also forced to go the speed limit. And so you can see that there is a shift of more people being um, neutral or in favor and fewer being opposed. But um, we can see when we asked about a government, government mandate for this, then, then we started to lose folks. Um, still slightly more in favor than voluntary installation. So it does go to show some people are gonna sort of have to be pulled into this kicking and screaming um, and aren't gonna just do it themselves. Um, but it definitely speaks to the public is gonna be likely more in favor of manufacturers to take the lead on this than the government to take the lead on speed limiters. So um, what have I learned? Well, I, I'm a little bit disheartened, um, especially with the number of fatal speed-related crashes that we've had on our roadways um, this year and last and, and really forever, you know, um, and it seems like there's a really big mismatch between the public perception of how much this is a problem um, to, to what at least I perceive as being a very big problem. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do to continue to educate the public get more earned media. You know, I think we've had a decade of news agencies covering texting and driving, but very, doing very little to do stories about speeding deaths. And, and I think we can do a lot to, to push this into people's consciousness. Um, and, you know, it, it seems to be, it's pretty much the norm to be traveling 
at least some level of speeding over the speed limit, whether it's, you know, five to 20 miles an hour, um, people uh, freely report that they routinely go faster than the speed limit. And so at some point we've got to figure out how can we shift the norm back to following the speed limit that really may be, um, you know, through speed limiters. And, and so I think we'll have to continue to, to look at that. But we definitely see that those who least believe speeding is a problem tend, be, tend to be the ones who are most likely to engage in really risky super speeding behavior. Um, now, perception of enforcement didn't appear uh, or does appear to um, motivate behavior. And so um, although the, the perception of enforcement was a little bit mixed, and I think, again, we're, we're sort of picking up a little bit on people's feeling that they have a free pass, but those who think you know, other people have a free pass. And, and so it, it's sort of going in both directions of people's perception of enforcement for speeding. So in the future, um, I wanna continue to look at the data that we have and potentially collect more data on regional differences. Um, you know, often we're, we're really thinking about the, the latest work in Minneapolis and St. Paul to lower city streets and, or, and speed limits but I think really looking at how these things break down across the state would be really interesting. Um, and, and more so I, in future studies, I'm really hoping to better capture why people follow the speed limit than why they violate the speed limit. I think it's, it's very varied. A um, lot of situational factors, time pressure, you're late, traffic is going too fast, so on and so forth, you had a bad day. All those things sort of push us back and forth, but my assumption is it may be more narrow to ask people, why did you follow the speed limit to a T? Tell me about the times when you didn't try to go not even a hair over the speed limit to try to figure out those motivations. So rather than motivating for speeding, um, look at motivation for speed compliance. Um, and finally, you know, further examining speed limiters. I think we have a big reckoning ahead of us with uh, cab implications. So with automated vehicles, different levels of automation, we're headed towards a future where it just won't make sense nor be practical for automated vehicles to allow operators to speed. But I think we're a long ways from the public being really up to speed on, <laughs> puns, no pun intended, um, for, for what that may mean if you're driving an automated vehicle um, really accepting that it may not allow you to decide, I'm gonna go 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And, and so really further um, examining those trade-offs between automation and having more opportunity to engage and you know, checking your email, if that means that you're not allowed to speed even one little bit. Um, so those are the things I hope to look at in the future. All right, so um, that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Such wonderful information. So many questions swirling around in my head. It would have been fun to be a bit of a fly on the wall in the research building, the discovery building at the State Fair this summer. But thanks for sharing everything that you've learned. So as I start to introduce our next speaker, Mark, if you want to pull your slides up and start sharing your screen, that would be great. And let me introduce Mark Basecki. Mark is just one of the many smiling faces that you all get to see if you were to actually go into the MnDOT office building, the State Aid Division. He's worked at State Aid since 2007, covering a variety of areas from traffic safety and, dis and disaster recovery to roadway standards and jurisdictional realignments. Mark is currently the State Aid Operations Engineer and a Project Manager for the Statewide Speed Limit Vision Project. He previously has worked for the city of Moorhead and the North Dakota DOT, but I promise we won't hold that against him. Mark, it is all yours. Steph, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I was running into a little bit of screen sharing issue there, but I think I'm up and running now. Does that look all right to you? It looks good, yep. Awesome, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for the opportunity to be able to share on the work for the speed limit uh, vision project that happened here in Minnesota. Uh, as Dr. Morris talked about, one of the things that we are not uh, talking about for this portion is speeding, those extra three letters, which is an active choice that a driver makes, as this driver did to drive in excess of 100 miles an hour, smashed into a bunch of uh, construction barrier um, delineators, and then make their way uh, up the freeway ramp the wrong way. 
or this driver that was driving double the posted speed limit uh, in downtown before running into a traffic signal, or this woman that was caught for driving in excess of 100 miles an hour in Egan, or this driver in St. Paul that was driving again double the posted speed limit and lost control of their vehicle. So what this project focused on is setting that vision statewide, helping us to elevate above the level of the specific crash, specific segment conversation that occurs and really focus on that higher level guiding vision for the state. Uh, this video will bring us through just a quick uh, overview of the project for this. In Minnesota, speed limits are set by state law or through a roadway engineering study. However, the conversation about how to set speed limits is expanded at both the local and national level. In 2019, the statewide speed limit vision project brought together a mix of professionals from transportation agencies and transportation users to work together and develop a unified vision for setting speed limits. This task force included city and county transportation professionals, public safety and health officials, state transportation officials and law enforcement professionals, and user group advocates from rural, suburban, and urban areas across the state. The task force included two groups, a technical advisory group and a transportation user group. The groups met multiple times separately, as well as together, where they discussed and reviewed national approaches to setting speed limits as they developed a vision. The task force realized through their discussions that even with varied backgrounds and interests, they shared many values when it came to setting speed limits. These shared values formed the basis of the vision statement. Speed limits are set with an emphasis on all users, with key influences of safety, engineering, and surrounding land use. The vision is accompanied by a list of core values that define the speed limits. The core values state that speed limits are affected by community context, land use, and street design, are governed by compliance through education and social norms, and are established through consistent technical evaluation and applied equitably across all communities. Promotion of safety culture, achieving compliance through equitable application of engineering, road design, education and enforcement, and recognizing different functions of roadways are all central to the vision. To learn more, find answers to frequently asked questions, and explore links to useful resources. Visit the project website at www.mnspeedlimitvision.org. So as the video talked about, uh, through the entire phase of that project, I'm going to now pull us into just a few specific elements along the way. So as the vision statement was stated in the video, uh, that it should be speed limits are set with an emphasis on all users with key influences for safety, engineering, and surrounding land use. And really that, that fact that the safety culture, which is so important to Minnesota's TZD program, which has formed that long word down trend, downward trend that we've seen uh, for fatalities, uh, not for the current uh, period, uh, really focuses on the safety culture, that reduction in crash severity, also the importance of surrounding land use, non-motorized users uh, should be of the utmost uh, consideration for this. And we also should achieve compliance through drivers actively complying to, to and through that, the, equi the equitable application of engineering, road design, education, and enforcement. And then also realizing that each road carries a different function and that speed limit should be set to recognize that. Uh, so again, I, I talked just a little bit about why is it important to have that statewide vision. Again, it is for us to rise above uh, the individual um, driven routes, individual driven events to more of that statewide purpose, what sets, what encompasses, what drives how speed limits should be set within Minnesota, and to evaluate what happened both uh, nationally uh, and internationally, and many times is what we did through this project as well. It spanned about a year. Uh, we looked at existing documentation, reviewed uh, Minnesota speed limit history, we brought together that diverse group, uh, and uh, looked at those different approaches. And then lastly, we formed that vision. So as much of the conversation is today, uh, or as the saying goes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Uh, back in 1881, that speed differential uh, between a motored vehicle and a non-motor vehicle drove the conversation then, or was a key part of that conversation. That is still the case uh, today as we look at speed limits and the importance of setting uh, reasonable speed limits on our system.
So we talked about having two groups. Uh, those two groups were the TAG and the TUG. Uh, so the TAG or the technical advisory group uh, for this project was made up of city and county engineers, uh, also state officials, uh, law enforcement, and uh, planners throughout the state as well. Uh, for our TUG group or user group, uh, we had members like Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, AAA Minneapolis, uh, Olmstead County Public Health, uh, the Bike Alliance of Minnesota. So what kind of topics did we talk about? We talked about all sorts of items and tidbits along the way, if you will, from functional class to mobility, uh, the different available methods for setting speed limits. Uh, where does Minnesota compare to those states that surround us uh, closely and then across the entire United States as well? Uh, we talked about crash data and histories. Uh, we talked about how we could influence uh, the driver in their um, travels uh, to help them pick the best speeds, if you will, on the system. So as I did talk about, there's lots of data out there. Uh, this graphic, I think, is a powerful one uh, that helps show that uh, by directing that and forming our, our decision-making processes, it can help us make uh, better, more targeted choices. And I think that's the key importance that we came out of this. So Minnesota, again, has one of the lowest uh, crash rates in the nation, crash fatality rates in the nation. Um, so as an example, uh, prior to this year, our uh, rate was the second lowest, if not the lowest in the nation. So uh, 0.6 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. So how far is 0.6 and how far is 100 million? Well, 100 million vehicle miles traveled would be from Minnesota if we went all the way around the sun, which is 92 million miles, not a single person would have passed away uh, from a motor vehicle crash. So that includes car car. Uh, that would also include non-motorized people involved in that same event. So uh, using that information, we can be more surgical and more targeted about how we go forward to continue to advance us towards our ultimate goal of zero fatalities. These two graphics just help to uh, provide an index of where Minnesota falls uh, with some of the other metrics that are available and some of the other metrics that are out there as well. Uh, the graphic on the left is uh, fatalities per 10,000 owned vehicles. Uh, the red line is the United States. The blue line is Australia. Um, so Minnesota falls well below the national and uh, even below Australia in this case, uh, who is a leader in traffic safety in uh, many respects as well. Uh, the graphic on the right hand uh, side uh, shows fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Uh, putting Minnesota at a 0.61. Again, the red line is the United States. Uh, the blue line is Australia. So oftentimes the question comes up or came up through this process is if we just lowered the speed limit, if we just posted our system at 25, uh, like the rest of the states that surround us, that would make our system safer. So we felt that it was important if safety is our goal through this process is of looking at speed limits and uh, just putting a number on the sign how would we compare to those states around us? So if we look at uh, the line shown in green, which is Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota is the line in red, uh, green and red. So I'll represent those two or talk about those two. So Wisconsin is the closest to Minnesota for vehicle miles traveled uh, population that uses uh, bicycle and walking and then um, total uh, metropolitan system size. So if we would sum uh, the total bike and pedestrian crashes that happened in this case uh, with the green line uh, being Wisconsin. So at 25, 30, and 35, uh, there's approximately 309 crashes. The red line representing Minnesota, if we'd sum those same crashes, it would be 149. So by just signing lower speeds, uh, we're, we're maybe not going to capture exactly what we want. Another graphic that helps, or more information that we talked about, uh, again, uh, was this great study that was completed about what allows us to influence drivers' behavior in the urban environment uh, for setting credible speeds. Um, uh, IT completed this article. It helped uh, us see, again, if we want to truly influence driver behavior, uh, it, it has to be beyond just that, which is much of what the group says in the vision overall that we're focusing on those multiple components, right? Bringing all of the E's together and using the, the designed roadway environment to ensure that we are um, helping drivers pick uh, the best speed and informing them of the speed. Uh, next step for this uh, is to continue to share the vision through presentations like this, writing articles and ongoing collaboration with other project partners. Also process improvement uh, related to speed studies and speed documentation and continuing to develop additional tools.
As, as many have talked about, Brian noted in his, there is the concerning trend of our current growth of fatalities in Minnesota, speed being the largest indicator of that, right? So as we work to create that safety culture, uh, we, it really is called upon all of us, uh, the five E's, if you will, even the everyone E, of course, uh, that culture is so vitally important for how we shape um, how drivers behave on our system today. So with that, I will send it back to Steph. Great. Thank you, Mark. There was one little salt board at the end. We were <laughs> practicing for today's webinar. Mark was making some jokes that he was going to put together all of his presentations through felt board. And so I, I was I was happy to see at least one little felt board there. I didn't want to I didn't want to miss my opportunity. Yep. No disappointing, right? <laughs> Uh, well, let me start introducing our next speaker. And while I'm doing that, Jessica, if you want to flip your video on and start sharing your screen, there she is. Um, let me introduce Jessica, Jessica Schleck. Jess is our Southeast Minnesota TZD Regional Coordinator. She began working with the Minnesota TZD program as a Safe Roads Coordinator for Dodge County in 2008. She was hired as the Southeast TCD Regional Coordinator in 2013 and has since built, coordinated, and supported coalitions across the Southeast region. Jess, it will be all yours in just a second. I want to remind everybody that if you have any questions, to go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentations. You can type those questions in as they um, come up for you, and we will start reading through them after Jessica's presentation. So it's all yours, Jess. Thanks. Thanks. So if you're seeing my PowerPoint, I'm assuming. I am, yes. Okay, just checking. So good afternoon. Uh, like, like Steph said, my name is Jessica Schleck. I'm the Southeast TCD Regional Coordinator, but I'm also the statewide SHSP Speed Action Team Co-Chair. So it didn't advance, sorry. There, so as Brian showed, we have a speeding problem. So our ultimate goal is to change traffic safety culture regarding speeding, but we wanted to explore what can be done now. So a group of traffic safety professionals from various agencies met last year to discuss what could be done now to help curb the speeding epidemic. Included on that list was to develop focus area specific strategic highway safety plan or SHSP action teams. So for those of you unfamiliar, the SHSP is a tool that identifies key areas to focus traffic safety efforts and provides data-driven, actionable strategies to reduce deaths and serious injuries on Minnesota roadways. So the SHSP is updated every five years to reflect current crash trends and to incorporate emerging, emerging traffic safety strategies. It was developed by blending crash data analysis with input from many diverse stakeholders Targeted input to shape the SHSP was gathered from stakeholders through multiple activities and venues, including the 2018 and 2019 TCD statewide conferences, the 2019 TCD regional workshops, and during meetings with the SHSP committee. So as I mentioned, I'm currently co-chairing the Speed Action Team along with Lisa Kahns from the Minnesota Safety Council. But we began forming a small group to collaborate, brainstorm, and prepare for the Action Team meetings. Our small group determined that the main objectives of the team would be to use the SHSP to develop an implementation plan for strategies and tactics, and to look outside the box for additional approaches to curb speeding. Uh, we also determined that we needed to understand the available data related to speeding, identify data needs, and then work to explore opportunities for new data sources. So the goal, the goal is to develop a statewide strategic speed management plan. The team, the team is made up of a variety of state, county, and city representatives from each of the four E's, as well as community groups from across the state. In developing a roster, we were looking at various perspectives that would be valuable to the team. Our initial meetings included an overview of the SHSP, a discussion of our five-year goals and speed statistics, including that based on what happened in 2020, speed has actually become an even larger issue than indicated in the original, in the original SHSP. So meeting discussion also included how to prioritize and tackle the strategies and tactics that are in the SHSP. So the team had a many high level discussions of priorities, which ultimately resulted in collaborative messaging becoming the focus of our team. It was easy to connect the priorities identified by the team with the SHSP as they both showed that messaging should be a top priority. So as I mentioned, collaborative messaging became the focus of the team. 
But there was much excitement about automated speed enforcement and improvements to roadway design process. So after discussion, it was determined that subcommittees focusing on these areas would benefit our team because both should really be included as part of a comprehensive strategic speed management plan. So the automated speed enforcement subcommittee has been researching the effectiveness of ASE in states that are, are currently using the technology. The subcommittee has also been discussing potential obstacles to implementation. The Improvement to Roadway Design Process Subcommittee has been focusing on education and awareness of engineering fundamentals to reduce speeding on rural roadways. Uh, the subcommittee is currently developing one pages focusing on the safety benefits of enhanced edge, edge lines, chevrons, and clear zones. The one pagers will be distributed to local agencies to refer to when applying for highway safety improvement plan program, HCIP funding. So, and the Improvement to Urban Roadway Design Process Committee has been focusing on engineering fundamentals, tree speeding on urban roadways. So the team determined that the need for speed research is critical as the research would help guide us in, in uh, statewide strategic communications efforts and the development of a statewide strategic speed management plan. So we all know that the world's changed, people, has, people have changed, the way people get their messages has changed, and we need good information to base our decisions. So step one is in this process isn't developing messages. It's doing the research into who's speeding, why they're speeding, and how we can motivate them to change their behavior. Or on the flip side, as Nicole or Dr. Morris mentioned, what makes them drive the speed limit? So we really, really want to know what, what makes them drive the speed limit. So uh, we're currently developing a scope of work to be used in securing a research consultant. Once the research is complete, we hope to move quickly into developing a statewide communication strategy. This is a collaborative effort across many agencies, so we'll take some time to accomplish. And I should note that Dr. Morris is part of the group working on that scope of work. So. So as a now goal, the team partnered with the Minnesota Safety Council and the Network of Employers for Traffic Safety to develop and implement an educational speed campaign focused on employers educating employees. So a news conference kicked off the campaign a couple weeks ago. A toolkit with template materials, including a webinar, has already been distributed to nearly 4,000 employers and will be available to all employers for their use anytime throughout the year. So in Southeast, we've been working on an innovative project to determine if digital vehicle feedback signs change behavior. The signs collect data, allowing us to analyze driver behavior. So we use local data to determine locations that are seeing high speeds and then deploy the VSF signs to record speeds at those locations. The signs were installed in stealth mode for two weeks to get a baseline of speeds, and then were lit to show drivers the speeds for two weeks. Then they were put back into stealth mode for two weeks. So, oops, wrong way, sorry about that. We were able to run reports to show if the system changed behavior. Uh, the comparison reports on your screen show the number of speed violations occurring in each time period. So the software that I'm using doesn't allow for comparison of multiple time periods. So in the first chart, the blue chart or the blue bar represents the time with the display in stealth mode, while the red bar represents the time the display was turned on, allowing for driver feedback. The report shows that overall there was a significant decrease in speeds when drivers received feedback. In the second chart, the blue bar represents the time when driver feedback is occurring, while the red bar represents the time the display was again placed in stealth mode. So again, you'll see that it shows that speeds increase when driver feedback is not present. So we've had great success using the science to slow drivers in Southeast, but it's important to know that a similar project was led by Tom Nixon a few years ago, and that similar projects are currently happening throughout the state. So the hope is to use the SHSP team to develop a statewide action plan, enabling us to collect and evaluate even more data and turn this innovative idea into a best practice. So there are so many pieces to this project that it really could be an independent webinar topic. So this is just a short, quick screenshot of what is happening, but there is more to come. So, my contact information is there, and I will pass it back to Steph. Great. Thank, Je thank Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Stumbling over my words already this afternoon. Uh, wonderful presentation. It's so exciting to hear that we're, we're, we're doing things. We're moving forward. And as a state, we're committed to trying to make some changes with this pandemic. So before we flip over to Q&A, 
please continue to put questions in the Q&A box as, uh, as you see on your screen. I will get through them in just a minute, but let me share my screen one more time and ask that as we prepare to move into the Q&A time, that you all take a minute to share your thoughts with us about today's webinar. So I want to um, encourage you to either use your phone camera and scan the QR code that you see on the screen here in front of you to access the evaluation, or there should also be a link to the evaluation in the chat box. We also will email a link that um, after the fact or after today's webinar if you want to fill out the evaluation that way. But we do really appreciate your feedback and we read through all of it. We really do use that feedback to help uh, prepare and select sessions for future webinars and fingers crossed, hopefully in-person conferences next fall. So let me turn things over to the Q&A part and let me see what we've got. Oh, I, and I apologize, I accidentally hit a button. Somebody had asked in Q&A if the PowerPoints would be shared from today's webinar, and yes, they will be. They will be posted to the TCD website shortly. We need a little bit of time to get them turned into PDFs and work with our communications team to get them posted, but the PDF, PDFs of today's PowerPoints will be available online. So let me start with one question that we have received. Since 2014, a Minnesota DPS has reported that a downward trend in pedestrian and cycling deaths in Minnesota has diverged with pedestrian deaths increasing, but cyclist deaths continuing to decline. Do any of the panelists have views on how speed or other factors may influence the divergence of these metrics? And um, Mark, Jessica, and Nicole, if you wouldn't mind all three of you flipping your videos on, and Brian, if you um, welcome to turn your video on too, if you would like to participate in the Q and A. So, anybody have any thoughts about the divergence of these metrics? I'm hoping Mark has a good answer for us. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you um, seem to have stumped the panelists. <laughs> yeah. It's an it, I mean, it is an interesting thing, and I and I have noticed that right that the pedestrian trend has um, continued upward while cyclists have remained uh, relatively stable uh, in that same same period. Uh, when we had looked at, uh, and this would have been like 2016, we printed out all the the crash reports and we actually read through them to try to figure out what was going on, because um, uh, others were reporting that they felt like it was just this amazing uptick in cell phone usage that was creating uh, issues. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's what we came to the same conclusion. Uh, it was, there was more use of the system by pedestrians and uh, we are actually seeing two pooling uh, happening. And one of those were people feeling like they could be seen better, which so at night at dusk dawn, they were walking and making riskier choices about their crossing. They felt like they could be seen when in reality they couldn't be seen. So maybe street level lighting instead of pedestrian level lighting. Uh, and the other one was just making bad choices, uh, crossing where they shouldn't cross standing in the road when they shouldn't stand in the road. Um, so, and uh, usually those riskier choices were a result of uh, consumption of alcohol, right? Driving, uh, poor choice making. Yeah, I mean, I, I have noticed the, the discrepancy myself and, and sort of tried to do some thought exercises on why I think that that we have this divergence. And, and I agree with Mark, I think that, that we've got two different types of populations are using the roadways in different ways. Um, and, and certainly we know that those mid-block crossings at night for pedestrians are, are introduce a lot of risk where um, cyclists are using the road in different ways and, and are more likely to have some sort of lights and, and have greater visibility. Um, but I think, you know, this always sort of points back to that there are systemic issues that, that make their way into our roadway system. And so when we think about things like sub, sub, substance abuse um, and drug and alcohol use, uh, people experiencing you know, housing issues, all of these things kind of permeate into our roadway system. And so as we see um, you know, some of these problems rising up, we're gonna see it spill out into our roadway system. And I think that that's really uh, largely what's going on with some of these pedestrian deaths. Brian, did you have something you wanted to add?
I, okay, I saw you shake your head. No, I saw your mute button come on and off there a couple of times. I can't hear you, Brian. I can see your lips moving. Do you want to try saying hello now? You, it looks like you're off mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. There we Still go. Still shows me muted. The only thing I was going to add to this is that, and I don't have the data in front of me, but we have seen a growth in um, fatal crashes involving um, pedestrians uh, on the side of the road that weren't intended, intending to be pedestrians. So, you know, typically it's on the shoulder of higher speed roadways. Um, and so that could be a piece of what's going on with the pedestrian fatalities. And again, I don't have that data right in front of me, but um, I know we have observed a growth in that type of fatality over the past few years. Great perspective, thank you. Another question, which has enlightened me, I didn't know that there was any way that um, people are, um, that states are being ranked on the quality of our drivers. But the question is, when looking at the comparison of speed in states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa, was there any thought given to the quality of the drivers? Iowa is ranked as having the worst drivers. Wisconsin is the 10th worst. And this person says, I believe Minnesota ranked 20th worst. So any thoughts about the, the quality of driver? And, and I there was a, a link in the Q&A that we could share if people are interested in that. I, I didn't go to that to see what was linked there. But any thoughts about quality of drivers? Well, that definitely challenges the Lake Wobegon, right? Where we're oh, supposed wait, to all be wait, above Wait, wait, wait. There may have been a correction that comes in. Minnesota okay. was 20th of the best drivers. So we were in the top 25. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that challenges <laughs> that challenge that we're greater than that we're better than the average. Yeah. I guess I hadn't heard of the driver, the driver index before. That sounds like an interesting metric. Um, it also looks like there was a question that came through chat. Any insights on setting variable speed limits based on weather, traffic, congestion, et cetera? We had made several attempts to try variable speed limits, but ran into issues with the dynamic nature of them. I'm not sure if that research was reinvigorated or not. Right, I'm not, oh, go ahead, Brian. I was just going to know, we, um, we do have a task force put together that's looking at um, work zone speeds and safety. Actually, um, we were asked to do this by the legislature. And so that is one of the approaches that um, we are touching on in the report. I think there's some interest in exploring that a little bit further. Um, it, it is a logistical headache, you know, how you decide what those different speeds are and then uh, managing them in real time um, can be really difficult. You know, from a work zone standpoint, we like the idea of being able to turn down the speed limit when workers are present and they're, you know, in the air working right in traffic. Um, but it needs to be someone's job to do that and they need to make sure that they're, you um, you know, uh, making the adjustments when it's appropriate uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there, there's some logistical challenges, but it, there is some interest in exploring that further. Great, thanks. Another question has come in. I can't help but feel a little bit dismayed by the fact that a non in, not insignificant number of people see speeding as both not being a problem and also don't think they'll be pulled over for doing so. Are there near-term initiatives that show promise on bringing those super speeder type situations back down? <laughs> With that, you know, look into that magic eight ball that you guys have. Um, well, I'm also dismayed. I, I can at <laughs> least share in, in that, um, you know, I, I think potentially doing high visibility enforcement can, can offer some, some short-term um, improvements. It's the hard thing about high visibility enforcement is it is pretty short lived. And so the, the moment that that enforcement is, is over, behavior starts to creep back up. Um, I think another potential solution that could get us 
quick bang for our buck is automated speed enforcement. We know that there are time distance halos around automated speed enforcement cameras, and there's generally good um, support among the Minnesota uh, driving population for introducing those in areas like you know, work zones and school zones and roadways where people have been killed. And so, you know, I, I think that if we're going to leverage technology and, and leverage our ability to get a good handle on this, I think automated speed enforcement is probably the best tool that, that is available that we just haven't had quite the um, legislative hurdles gone through to introduce that into um, our roadway system, but it, it's very hard. You can't have police on every stretch of the roadway. I mean, that's that's the whole problem with why people think that the likelihood that they're gonna get pulled over is pretty low and why they're actually pretty correct in that in that sort of perception, right? Um, so, so that is the truth. You, you can speed and chances are good. You'll get away with it almost every time. I would so, say, that's an uplifting, uh, uplifting answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> to, build up, to build on what Nicole said, I believe uh, it's the Minnesota Safety Council, and Jessica, help me if I'm missing on that one, is sending out uh, a much broader campaign focusing on uh, reaching out to employers and employees saying that it is all of us working together that can make a difference, right? That it really is driving the that idea of the healthiest lawn is, is that that is the thickest and the richest, right? So the most people in that space making good choices helps to balance out maybe those that would make a riskier choices, right? They, they have the control group out back out on the road, if you will. That's great. There's been so much talk about this kind of positive social norming and what can we do and how do we all work together? And I think that, you know, that's such an important piece to changing behavior and changing this problem. Um, another question has come in back to the variable speed limits. Quick question, is there a significant change in deaths per mile traveled, not crashes overall, in Minnesota's winter, up or down due to speed factors that variable speed limits might address? Mark or Brian, are you familiar enough with the data to be able to address that? I, I could talk about before, but not current. Uh, so before, I, I think what we see happens is there's a little, there is a fast rise, right, where drivers have to assess what is the road doing, then other drivers begin to see other people in the ditch or other people not on the road, and then they begin to adjust their behavior. So uh, when we studied it before, we did not see an overrepresentation either in fatal or serious injury crashes over the entire storm event. I think you get a little, a fast rise like you would expect while drivers uh, are readjusting, right? So right on the onset of a rainstorm, uh, before they then readjust, right? Uh, the same for a uh, snow event. Yeah, and I just add our fatality rates are lowest during the winter. So um, poor road conditions, you know, um, might help reduce traffic, but they definitely reduce speeds. People recognize the need to slow down. And then when they do end up in a crash, um, you know, they're typically more likely to be property damage and less likely to be life changing. So, and even in the past, um, since the pandemic started, so last winter, I guess, really, we've had one winter, um, those fatality, uh, in, in essence, the fatality rate per day um, was pretty close to what we had been seeing in previous years. Our jump has been, um, in essence, when the weather's nice. That's, that's when we've seen our difference in fatalities. So, Wonderful. Well, let me wrap up. I, we're getting really close to the 315 time period. So I just want to really say a big thank you to all of our speakers and panelists today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. This is a problem that we are going to be wrestling with for a long time. There's no easy solution. There's no easy answer. There's no low hanging fruit. There's not one thing that we can do that we can snap our fingers or we would have done it. So thanks for sharing your insights. Thanks for continuing to be champions in this work and for helping us make progress on our, on our journey. Um, thank you to those of you for tuning in today. We do have several more webinars coming up. Check the TCD website. We'd, be, we'd love to see you at some additional webinars. And um, lastly, I just always like to end by saying, Drive safe. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye, Steph. Thanks. Bye, guys. <laughs>